Welcome into the program. Thank you so much for being with us. Had my mic off there for a second, but it's okay now. But yeah, great to great to have you with us. Thank you so much for being part of the program. And I know that the thing that is on everybody's mind, at least in this state today, is that turns out Alabama did not win the national championship, which I, I got to be honest, I was really surprised. I thought that they were going to win. I thought that they were actually going to win in slightly more convincing fashion than a lot of people did. And, and boy, was I wrong. Uh, Alabama losing to Clemson, I think 44 to 16 was the final score. So I don't really like either one of them, to be honest. Clemson's like a weird off version of Auburn. <laughs> In fact, I saw it just today that one of the hashtags that was trending on Twitter is all in, which is hilarious because all in was the slogan for Auburn for a long time. And so it's like everything that happens at Clemson is just some kind of weird off brand uh, if if you if you're a comics fan, this is a perfect analogy for it. If you are a comic book fan, and you know there's Superman and then there's Bizarro Superman, which is like a weird reflection of Superman in a cracked mirror. Like everything for him is backwards. He gets stronger when you put kryptonite around him. He gets weaker in the sun. I mean, it's just it's a it's a weird reversal, and so. Clemson is just like that weird off-brand Pop-Tart or that weird off-brand product that you buy that it's kind of similar to the original, but not exactly. People have called it Auburn with a lake, and so because of that, I've never been a huge fan of Clemson. And of course, I can't stand Alabama. And so these two teams winding up there, I didn't even watch most of the game. I missed a lot of it, but of course, that's what's on everybody's mind. That's a big thing in our state that Alabama wound up losing a national title to Clemson the second time that that has happened since the BCS tournament style championship has happened. So, you know, not a big fan of either one, but congratulations to Clemson. I am glad that Alabama didn't win another championship, but I do have to address something before we get into some of the hard news of the day. And this has been bothering me. Clemson, you've got to do something about your mascot. Like it, it's just, it, it's bad. It's, it's not just kind of bad. It's really bad. It looks like if a kid made their own tiger stuffed animal. I mean, it's just really, really strange and creepy. Like, look at this. I mean, that's horrifying. That thing is like staring right into the depths of your soul. If you've ever seen Ghost Rider where he just like looks at the guy and stares at them and they burst into flame because it's burning their soul. That's what I feel like whenever I'm looking like I'm seriously freaked out looking at this thing. I don't know who at Clemson was coming up with the mascot and saw that and was like, yeah, that's a good idea. We'll go with that one. Like Auburn's tiger, Albert, Albi, I get that I'm a little spoiled with him because he's one of the best mascots in college football. And I mean, he's won several awards with it. He's won, I think, the Capital One mascot thing. Uh, so Albie's really good and I understand that I'm spoiled with him and it, he was designed by Walt Disney. So of course he's really cool, but even like the other tiger mascots, Mizzou's and, and LSU's tigers tend to come from the more, let's make it fearsome looking. And so they don't look like Albie who Albie's just kind of more cute and cartoony. Whereas Mike, the tiger and, and, uh, whatever Mizzou's is and some of the other, mascots that have tigers like they're they're more intimidating looking or they go for the cute factor like obby but i'm sorry that was just weird this it's it, seriously i think it's so strange <laughs> they've they've continued to go with this i mean what are those eyes made out of it looks like they took a cross section of pineapple <laughs> and just stuck them on the tiger's face <laughs> But nonetheless, Clemson, Clemson, just do something to fix your mascot. It's just weird, man. Uh, something's got to be done about that. I, I really do think for your own sake, because, and again, that goes, that applies to the Bizarro Superman thing, because if you were to look at a picture of Obby and you were to look at a picture of that, that would be the Bizarro Obby. That would be the weird offset version of Obby. And so it's just a really odd, I don't know, thing, thing to go with, but regardless, 
Let's get into some some other local news, something that's uh, a little bit more politics oriented. Apparently, there was another disinformation operation that was staged by the Democrats against Roy Moore during that election. And the New York Times has reported this, that a veteran progressive activist, and again, that's their words, not mine, from Florence, Alabama, admitted to creating the Dry Alabama Facebook page. And I'm just going to go ahead and read a little excerpt from the article there in the New York Times. The Dry Alabama Facebook page illustrated with stark images of car wrecks and videos of families ruined by the drink had a blunt message. Alcohol is the devil's work and the state should ban it entirely. Along with companion Twitter feed, the Facebook page appeared to be the work of Baptist teetotalers who supported the Republican Roy S. Moore in the 2017 Alabama Senate race. Pray for Roy Moore, one tweet exhorted. In fact, the Dry Alabama campaign, not previously reported, was a stealth creation of progressive Democrats who were out to defeat Mr. Moore. The second of such secret efforts has been unmasked. In a political bank shot made the last two weeks of the campaign, they thought associating Mr. Moore with calls for statewide alcohol ban would hurt him with the moderate business-oriented Republicans and assist the Democrat Doug Jones, who won the special election by hair-thin margins. All right, so let's break into this real quick. If you're looking at Roy Moore's campaign, it was razor thin. Bear jo- uh, Doug Jones barely, barely defeated him by about the narrowest of margins. It wasn't quite close enough to trigger an automatic recall, but or an automatic recount. But boy, it was close. I mean, we're talking about less than a percent. I think the well, I don't know. The final total, I believe, was one point one percent. But nonetheless, so. We're talking about not very many votes separating Roy Moore from Doug Jones. And so when you're looking at this and when you break it down and looking at looking at these campaigns, I think that even when you're looking at that small razor thin margin of error, I think that's the reason that this is getting publicity. But honestly, I don't believe that these disinformation campaigns were what contributed to it. Now, when it comes to Roy Moore's campaign, he ran a awful campaign and was a severely flawed candidate. I, to this day, cannot understand how he made it out of the primary. And you remember that during that primary, I was calling for Mo Brooks, who was the obvious clear choice, in my opinion, who should have been the senator from the state of Alabama. But here's here's the deal, and this is where this all really, really boils down to. These disinformation campaigns are dirty and underhanded tricks by the Democrats, they are not technically illegal, though. I mean, it's you. if you're talking about making it illegal for a person to make a fake profile on Facebook and pretend that he's supporting the candidate that he doesn't like to make the candidate look terrible, there's not really a whole lot you can do with that. Even if we were to take the more extreme example, like let's say this guy made up a fake chapter of the Klan and used that as a support for Roy Moore to hurt his chances. First of all, there's really not anything that you can do about that. And second of all, and I know that I'm dealing with the ideal as opposed to reality, the endorsements of who a, a, who likes a candidate really should have nothing to do whatsoever with whether or not you vote for them. I realize that it does make a difference to some people. But ideally, who likes a candidate shouldn't have any bearing whatsoever on whether or not you actually vote for them. Now, there is a difference in whether or not somebody happens to like the candidate and is actually involved with their campaign. For example, right out of the gate, when the primaries were going on, someone who very loudly, openly voiced support for Roy Moore in that campaign was Stephen Bannon. And that bothered me, but I didn't hold it against Roy Moore. Because I don't like Bannon, but Roy Moore can't help the fact that Bannon happened to be a fan of his. And as horrible a human being as Stephen Bannon is, Roy Moore doesn't have any affiliation with him when it comes to that. However, as the campaign went on, Roy Moore started to get a little bit more desperate, and he actually reached out to Stephen Bannon and had Steve Bannon campaigning for him. And at that point, I was like, you know what? That's a bridge too far. Can't get on board with it. 
And actually, that was the determining factor. That was the reason that in the last few days before the election, I saw Stephen Bannon actually working with the campaign for Roy Moore. And I was like, you know what? I'm done. I can't vote for Roy Moore. If he's going to associate himself with people like Steve Bannon, I, I can't do it. And so that was really the last straw for me. But I do all that and I say all that to illustrate a point that even if you think that the teetotaling thing was stupid, you really shouldn't look at that and say, oh, there's a group of teetotalers in, in Florence, Alabama that thinks that we should outlaw, all, outlaw alcohol. That's hard to say. And uh, because of that, I'm not going to vote for more because they like Roy Moore. Well, that's dumb. And I said the same thing about when you had people that were signing on with Democrats who happened to be like radical socialists, that kind of thing. Look, the Democrats can't help who supports them. Now, if they're actually involved with it or they're encouraging it or they are sympathetic to it, then we're talking about something else. But that's something that they did. If we're talking about just some random group that happens to endorse you, that's not necessarily your fault. In fact, there are certain groups that would probably, knowing that they're very unpopular, endorse candidates that they specifically do not like just so they can help the candidate that they do like. And this is actually a great example of people doing exactly that. This guy pretending to be some kind of temperance society that hates alcohol, that wants it outlawed, and then supports Roy Moore. So people will think that that's, I guess, one of Roy Moore's official stances that we need to outlaw alcohol in the state of Alabama. I guess that was sort of the idea, but they've already done this with the fake Russian profiles. We talked about that earlier. The first disinformation campaign launched against Roy Moore was it was a bunch of uh, apparently people pretending to be Russians or Russian operatives and then throwing their support for Roy Moore, endorsing him, trying to make people think that Roy Moore was somehow in bed with the Russians or that he was working with the Russians. And so this is something that we've unfortunately seen before. And you can also have it go the opposite way. You can have it go the opposite way as well. For example, with Martha Roby. Martha Roby, who's the representative for the 2nd District in Alabama, the district that I reside in. She's my representative in the House. And I hate saying that because I can't stand her, but that's, that's who represents me. Anyway, Martha Roby, she actually benefited from a campaign back when she was running against Becky Gerritsen, not this last time, but two years prior to that in the, the general election. And I remember... That we, or sorry, in the primary election. And I remember when she was running against Becky Gerritsen, one of the things that was just absolutely ridiculous is because Martha Roby is the definition of an establishment swamp Republican, and she wanted to distance herself from that, what she did was she had the Tea Party endorse her, a Tea Party group in Alabama endorse her. Here's the problem. When you looked into it, the Tea Party group that endorsed her, turns out it was one dude. And he wasn't really with the Tea Party at all. I had no affiliation with them. But he had a Facebook page where he would post a lot of stuff about politics. And he created this fake group and then endorsed Martha Roby and made her his candidate so that other people would be tricked into thinking that there were Tea Party members that were actually supporting Martha Roby. I can assure you they did not, at least not in the primary. There probably were some that did once the general hit, but definitely during the primary, Becky Gerritsen was the, the candidate of choice during the Tea Party. Now, I'm not doing that because I'm trying to dredge up old wounds or anything like that. I'm just trying to give you a little proper political context that this is not a new occurrence, and it is also not something that is illegal. As dirty and underhanded and deceptive as it is, it's not illegal, which is the reason that who endorses a candidate should not matter all that much in the grand scheme of things. It should not matter all that much when it comes to your decision-making process of who you're going to vote for. See, this is this the only reason that these are somewhat effective, and I don't think that these particular ones were very effective or had a huge impact on the outcome of the elections, but the reason that these are even somewhat effective is because there are people out there in the world, probably not if you're listening to me, Probably if you're listening to me right now, if you are somebody that is interested enough in news, interested enough in politics, that you are listening to a video podcast about it, you're probably not in this category. I think I feel pretty safe in saying that. But there is a large group of people that basically get to the point that they don't want to do their own thinking. 
they just kind of want to find a few people that they kind of have some similarities in their political agreements. And then whoever they endorse, whoever they vote for, yep, I'm going along with that. That is a really bad way to decide how to cast your votes. And I say this to people that are fans of mine. If you are a fan of mine, then you need to think for yourself. I want you to listen to my commentary. I want you to take it seriously. If I didn't, I wouldn't be doing it. But I also want you to make your own decisions. I don't speak for anybody. I don't think for anybody. If you are deferring to me to give you all the information that you need and whatever policy that I think is best, whatever person that I think is best, that you go along with that, please don't do that. I don't want to be responsible for doing anybody else's thinking. I want to spur on thinking in you. I want to spur you on to do your own contemplation and your own homework and look into the issues yourself. And I want to bring you information to help you with that. But I do not want to be responsible for doing anybody else's thinking. I'm not a proxy for you being able to do your own research and look into matters yourself and make your own decisions on what you think is right. That's not my job. That's not what I want to do. But a lot of people in this country have basically, because thinking is hard, they've deferred their decision making to somebody else that is more knowledgeable. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with deferring to somebody's expertise and thinking, okay, this person does this for a living. They study it a lot more than I do. So I'm going to take their opinion under advisement and it may influence my opinion. But that's very different than just taking all the thinking out of it and say, yep, yeah, whatever they go along with, that's what I'm doing. See, that's not something that an adult, somebody that's very responsible does. And this project was not just some flash in the pan, one guy making a Facebook page. To be clear, this is a project that got $100,000 worth of funding from Democrat operatives. And to the Democrats that funded this, I would say, how much good could that $100,000 have done elsewhere? You guys claim to care about the poor and care about the sick, and, and I want to take your word on it. I want to take it at face value and believe that that really is a concern of yours. How many food banks would this have helped? How many homeless shelters would this have helped? How many closed drives and charities could have been done with a $100,000 that you instead spent to put out lies about Roy Moore? And you knew you were lying at the time. It's one thing to have bad information and to continue to circulate that information or to skew information in a certain direction. This is a flat out lie by any measure. And they knew that they were specifically trying to deceive people into thinking that Roy Moore had some kind of stance against alcohol at all. And so because of that, this is one of the most reprehensible misuses of the blessings that God gave you that I've ever seen. And this was a hundred thousand dollars of out of state liberal funding. So it wasn't even money from the state of Alabama. It's people from the outside trying to influence Alabama's election, which again, not illegal. It's not illegal to fund a Facebook page and a Twitter feed and all this other stuff, but still very underhanded. And I think a very poor use of resources. So the person that admitted to being a part of this whole operation, Matt Osborne, during this interview with the New York Times, he said, if you don't do it, talking about this deception tactic, if you don't do it, you're fighting with one hand tied behind your back. You have a moral imperative to do this, to do whatever it takes. Unfortunately, whether they would admit to it or not, there are an awful lot of people that share this guy's thought process that the other side is so bad that you have to just do whatever it takes in justifies the means. And this happens on both sides. There were people that said Hillary Clinton is so bad. I'll vote for anybody that's opposing her. Donald Trump is so bad that I'll vote for anybody that's opposing him. That's not the right way to look at this. That's not the right way to look at politics. Politicians should have to earn your vote. They should have to give you a reason that they deserve you to vote for them. But unfortunately, that's not what we've done in this country in the past several years. The other side is evil and reprehensible, and this election is the most important election that has ever happened, and we're not going to survive. The country is going to go under if this person gets elected. 
I mean, just on and on and on and on. And you know what? There have been times where I was probably guilty of this. I probably took it too far when it came to Barack Obama and the harm that he did to the country, which was substantial, but we were able to survive and I probably overplayed it a little bit. But nonetheless, unfortunately, politically, this is the mindset of a lot of the voting electorate that you do whatever it takes, smear, lie, whatever it takes to make sure that person doesn't get into office. To which my question has always been, whether you're talking about politics or talking about something else, if you're so terrified of your enemy that you're willing to do that, how are you better than your enemy? You become the bad guy by doing this. You're the one that becomes evil. I mean, the, the ends justify the means. That's how the Nazis justified the Holocaust. That, well, we're trying to build utopia. We're trying to make a better society. And so anything that stands in our way, whether it be the Jews or the United Kingdom or the United States or whatever else, we're going to take it down. The end justifies the means always, if followed to its logical conclusion, results in some kind of evil or tyrannical force because it will justify any action, no matter how bad, in order to get what they want. It is the epitome of selfishness. And that's why when you're looking at this and when you're looking at the way that the Democrats decided that it was in their best interest, this guy says, it's a moral imperative. It would be morally wrong for me not to lie, to do this, to do everything in my power to make sure Roy Moore is not the senator from the state of Alabama. How you win matters. Doing things the right way matters. It is better to lose honorably than to win by cheating or to win by underhanded, me uh, underhanded methods. And this whole idea that we have that you can, this is really kind of a testament to moral relativism, that as long as where you're going at the end is what in your mind is what is morally justified, that you can just throw morality out the window in the journey to get there. It always, even if you wind up reaching that goal, means that you sell your soul to do so. And just listening to this really, really bothers me. And what's so sad about this is that this guy was willing to do this and to throw morality to the side and do whatever it took to keep Roy Moore out of office, and I doubt this had any effect on the election at all. These things rarely do. It's very rare that they actually have a legitimate impact on the election itself. And so this is really what it is so sad that we've reached a society that believes that winning, winning something is trivial in when we're talking about eternity, you know, taking it from that perspective, something as trivial as a Senate election where the senator was only going to serve half a term anyway for three years that they are willing to just cast aside morality, cast aside truth, all in the name of winning a Senate election. This is a person that does not have their priorities in the right order. So speaking of people that do not necessarily have their priorities in the right order, I did want to address this. Um, we're going to have to do a little bit of a setup here just in case you haven't heard. So Hank Johnson... Hank Johnson is a Democrat representative from the state of Georgia, and he was in the news recently just last week and had a response by Dan Crenshaw, and so there's a little bit of a spat going on between the two of them. But Hank Johnson is one of my favorite representatives, not because I like any of his policies, but because he has one of the greatest, uh, <laughs> one of the greatest moments in TV history, in my opinion. And I know a lot of TV. It was part of my major. He has one of the best moments in TV history when talking to uh, an advisor here about Guam and repositioning troops in Guam. I don't know how many square miles that, that is. Do you happen to know? I don't have that uh, figure with me, sir. I can certainly supply it to you if you'd like. Yeah, my, my fear is that uh, the whole island will uh, become so overly populated that it will tip over and uh, and capsize <laughs> uh, we don't anticipate that the uh, 
the Guam population, I think, currently about 175,000. And again, with 8,000 Marines and their families, it's an addition of about 25,000 uh, more uh, into the population. I love that clip for a number of reasons. I think not the least of which is that the general is just flabbergasted there. He's like, yeah, it's, it's not, <laughs> he's trying to take it seriously. He's trying not to laugh, but he's like, yeah, it's, it's not really a concern that we have right now. <laughs> he thinks the whole island is just going to flip. <laughs> uh, I'm not a geologist, but that's not how islands work. <laughs> Oh, uh, you can't make this stuff up. So you can tell by that clip, Hank Johnson, not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but uh, he came out this past week and spoke to the NAACP, I believe in Atlanta, and made several comparisons to the president of the United States, Donald Trump, as being Hitler and tried to draw this equivalency, this one-to-one -one comparison between the two of them and, and tried to come up with a lot of huge false equivalency fallacies to try to justify saying that Trump is Hitler. And so Dan Crenshaw comes out with this video sort of in response to that. And he doesn't go through the whole thing. He just goes through a segment of it. But I think that he hits the note exactly where it needs to be. Dan Crenshaw. My colleague, Congressman Hank Johnson, had this to say recently. Much like Hitler took over the Nazi party, Trump has taken over the Republican Party. It's now known as the Trump Republican Party. Donald Trump supporters are older, less educated, less prosperous, and they are dying early. Their lifespans are decreasing, and many are dying from alcoholism, drug overdoses, liver disease, or simply a broken heart caused by economic despair. Okay, Mr. Johnson. President Trump is a lot of things, but he's not Hitler. He didn't kill millions of people. He didn't start a world war. He didn't have any concentration camps. And to accuse him of being Hitler is intellectually dishonest. And frankly, it's a huge insult to the millions of Jews who died under Nazi Germany. But if you want to insult President Trump, at least you're picking on somebody your own size. At least you're picking on somebody who can fight back. But you went on to insult, degrade, and demean tens of millions of Americans who voted for him called them drug addicted, uneducated, unhappy alcoholics. This is a cowardly form of politics. No matter how much I will disagree with you in Congress, I will never ever insult the good Americans who voted for you. I will never paint an entire half of the country as deplorables or fools or the dregs of society. I'll never do it. And if I ever do, you better call me out on it because I can't imagine a worse form of leadership. These people are exercising their right and their voice the only way they can, which is through their vote. They don't have a TV show, they don't have a radio show, they don't have a weekly column or a big social media following, they have a vote. And you use your public platform to insult and demean them. This is not the behavior we expect from a member of Congress. So I'll leave you with this. Pick on somebody your own size. Pick on me if you like. My office will be right down the hall from yours. I'll see you in Washington. So Representative Dan Crenshaw, with I think a lot of words of wisdom in that particular post, he, he did that via Twitter, and I do apologize for the sound. I don't think that he had the best microphone there, <laughs> but nonetheless, striking exactly the right note, in my opinion, uh, Representative Crenshaw from Texas. And let's break down Johnson first. <clears throat> Real quickly, let's, let's break down some of the things that Hank Johnson said there. Uh, first of all, he said that the reason that Trump is like Hitler is because Donald Trump took over his party the same way that Hitler took over his party. So now it's the Trump Republican Party, just like it's the Hitler Nazi Party. Well, that's true. Hitler was the head of his party, and Trump is the head of his party. He's the one that's kind of steering the ship right now. He's in the highest office in the land, and so he's sort of the, the, big, the big face, the big figure. He's the one sort of steering the whole thing. And that's also true of Barack Obama and Bill Clinton, and Jimmy Carter, and pretty much anybody that attains the office of president. You pretty much become the leader of your party once you are the president of the United States. It just kind of goes along with the office. Um, I think you could make an argument that there might be some exceptions in some of the presidents, but especially if you're looking at the more notable ones, Teddy Roosevelt, FDR, Lincoln, 
I mean, th it's pretty clear that they were the heads of their party. They were the ones that were leading their party and setting the direction for their party. And so this idea that because Hitler was the head of his party and Trump is the head of his party, see, they're Nazis. No, <laughs> that's true of Republicans, Democrats, pretty much any political party in any country. If you have somebody that is in an executive position, you just kind of wind up setting the direction for the rest of the party. That's how it works. And there are people that referred to it as Trump's Republican Party. Well, what about when people referred to the Republicans back in the 1800s as the Party of Lincoln? What about when people referred to the Democrat Party as the Clinton Democrat Party or the Obama Democrat Party? I know that I've used those terms. I heard Democrats refer to themselves in, the, in those terms. They said it's Obama's party now. And they were correct. He largely hedged out the Clintons and their influence, and I think that that was very prevalent if you're looking at this last election. So when you're taking all this and putting it in its proper historic context, none of the points that he was making really made any sense. And he goes into a little more detail that, that Dan Crenshaw skipped a little bit, and you can see in the time lapse there that he did that for time. But he goes into a whole bunch of other stuff about nationalism and, and all this other stuff. But again, you're attributing motive, and this is where this whole thing goes back to. You're attributing motive to the only reason that any of these people voted for Trump is because Trump is a racist, which again, I don't think that you can prove. I've not seen any compelling evidence to support that. In fact, I've seen pretty good evidence to the opposite. But they keep saying that Trump is a racist, ergo everybody that voted for him must also be a racist. I don't believe that. I don't believe that for a second. I don't believe that even if Trump actually were a racist, that everybody that voted for him would have necessarily been a racist. You know what's weird? I still believe that Governor George Wallace was a racist, and some of his policies were very racist, and he enjoyed a considerable amount of support from the black community. I don't believe it was because they hated black people. I thought that they believed that he would work within their self-interest. Whether that was right or wrong, I don't know, but the thing is you can't attribute just because somebody happens to have a problem that every single person that cast a vote for them also had that problem. I to this day believe that if nothing else, you could say at least culturally, Barack Obama was a Marxist, but I don't believe every single person that cast a vote for him was a Marxist. There were some people that did so because they liked Marxism and socialism. There were also some people that voted for him just because he's a Democrat and they've been a lifelong Democrat. There were also some people that voted for him because they didn't like John McCain and they didn't like uh, uh, why. I don't know why I just blanked on this guy's name. Uh, I wanted to say Rick Santorum, but I know that's not it. I'm talking about the, uh, the newly elected senator from Utah, Mitt Romney. Why was I having so much trouble remembering Mitt Romney? Anyway, so uh, they didn't like Mitt Romney, they didn't like John McCain, and so they voted for Barama, uh, Obama thinking that he was the lesser of two evils, whatever it may be. I don't assume evil intention in every single person that voted for him. I question their wisdom, maybe. I think that they were maybe incorrect in doing so, and I'll talk to them about that. But that's very different than saying you're an evil, hateful, Nazi, racist, alcoholic, bigot, drunk, old, uh, you know, country fried, rube, whatever you want to call it. He's assuming all these evil negative things about anybody that would even consider voting for Donald Trump. And I say that as somebody who didn't vote for the man. I'm saying that as somebody that would not fall into that category. And yet I understand that it's completely wrong to assume that every single person that voted for a particular person shares all of their vices. Whether real or imagined. And he did paint a picture there that Dan Crenshaw accurately points out was incorrect. Uh, one of the things that he did was age. And that's been something that the Democrats have really been saying since about the 1960s. They've been saying that eventually the Republican, that's just a bunch of old white guys. They're going to age out. They're going to be relegated to uh, just a party in the South and, and maybe a handful of other states, and they're going to be completely irrelevant. I've heard that even in my lifetime several times. And if you look back through the history of this country, Democrats have largely been saying that pretty much since the 60s. They've been saying that the Republicans are just a bunch of old people. They're going to die out soon. We're not even going to have any Republicans anymore. And yet, what happens is, despite this, there continue to be more Republicans. Why? Because actually there was a, a kernel of truth in what Hank Johnson just said, that usually 
your Republican voters tend to be older. Well, that doesn't make any sense because if that was also true in the 60s, in other words, you know, you're talking about 50, 60, almost 60 years now in the past. Well, then how is it that we keep having more Republicans? Because when the younger people who are a bit naive, haven't really been out in the world, they get a dose of reality. They tend to turn more towards Republicanism. They tend to turn more towards conservatism. As people get older, they get more conservative because they have a little bit more life experience. They have a little bit more maturity. They don't tend to act on their emotions as much. And so because of that, they get a little older and wiser and then they wind up changing their political affiliation. I'm not saying this always happens as a natural process and that that doesn't mean that we should just ignore trying to recruit young people or reaching out to young people as conservatives. I'm not saying that at all. As somebody who's 29 years old and a conservative, I can tell you that that's really important. But what I am saying here is that this attack that Frank Johnson or sorry, Hank Johnson has been lobbying against. That's an old attack. That's they've been saying that forever and it's never been true. They've been saying that that generation was going to die out since the sixties and they never have. Why? Because the people that do die keep getting replaced with younger people that get a little bit older and wiser and decide, maybe I should look into this conservatism thing. You know what? I really do like keeping more of my own money. I really do like the idea that we're not taxing people to death. I really do like the idea that my personal liberties aren't under attack. Maybe they even get a little bit more religious and thus become a little bit more socially conservative. Studies show that the people that attend churches on a regular basis tend to be a little bit older. Not saying that there are no young people in the churches, but generally those people, when they start being more aware of their own morality, uh, mortality, they start worrying about things like their family and how they're going to raise their kids, then they start getting more serious about church attendance and become more socially conservative as well. And so there's a number of reasons why this is a really stupid attack that has they've been using for 60 years now, and it still isn't right. It's still incorrect. Then you also have uh, this idea. You remember, you remember how the left freaked out when Donald Trump said that on our southern border we have people coming through the border that are murderers, rapists, gang members, drug dealers, and I assume some good people as well. You remember how the left freaked out on that and then ignored the, and I assume some good people as well, and just focus on, he's saying all illegal immigrants are, are rapists and murderers and all these other things. Well, again, if you're going to freak out about that, if you're going to freak out about the generalization, then why is it okay? And by the way, I think that that was probably not the best way for the president to handle that at the time. I'm not saying that that was okay. I'm just saying that if you're going to freak out about that, why is it that nobody is looking at Hank Johnson and saying, well, he's calling all Trump voters a bunch of old, uh, you know, self-loathing, alcoholic, diseased, uh, uneducated morons. And he didn't even add the, and I assume some good people too. No, he assumed that was everybody. And so when Trump says that, we're supposed to assume, we're supposed to ignore the end of that and ignore the, and I assume some good people too, and assume that Trump was just saying, no, everybody that comes across the border is that way. But when Hank Johnson says that, okay, well, it's, it's okay to assume that all Trump voters are that way. It's okay for him to say that and, and say that half the country fits this description, saying that they're oddly enough dying of like liver disease and saying that they're all a bunch of alcoholics and they're uneducated and, and all these other just horrible things. Dan Crenshaw is 100% right. It is wrong to assume that half the country is like that, and I appreciate him making a stand on that. He hits exactly the right note. By the way, another thing that I thought was funny in there that he included is he said that, well, they all are staying at home, they're shut-ins, they don't have any friends, and they're just sitting there, of, and the reason they voted for him is because they've got broken hearts because of economic disparity. Whoa, 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 whoa. rewind. I thought that the only reason somebody would vote for Trump is because they've got a lot of money and they're greedy and selfish and want to hang on to it. That's the line that the Democrat Party always gives us, right? That all the poor people vote for Democrats and all the rich people vote for Republicans. That the only people that vote for Republicans are a bunch of greedy old fat cats that want to hold on to their own, own money. So which is it, Hank Johnson 
are the people that vote for Republican, are they a bunch of old sags, uh, sad sacks that don't have any money? Or are they a bunch of rich industrialists? Because it's got to be one or the other. Can't be both. And so this is really where you have a, a big disparity between reality and Hank Johnson's version of reality. So what this all goes back to, and this is why Crenshaw, I think, hits the right note here. The attack on the voting base is what's really beyond the pale because you're assuming intent. And whenever you're assuming intent, it's almost impossible to have a discussion after that. I know that it, it comes around all the time with me. For example, if you are trying to do something just as a, a local law enforcement agency and you say, man, this, uh, this particular part of the neighborhood, it's pretty rough. We probably need to add some more patrols there. And then you add some more patrols there and you start arresting more people and they say, ah, see, that happened to be the bad side of town. That happened to be the place where all the, you know, if it was, uh, if it's a racially motivated thing, they, they try to attribute that they they'll try to attribute things to sexism, whatever it is. And so they start assuming intent in the people that they disagree with, even though it may have had nothing to do with it. Same thing with, for example, voter ID laws. Those things are not to keep people of certain races to vote. It's to keep people that are not citizens from voting. That's the only intent behind them. And they'll often say that if it affects somebody disproportionately, which I haven't seen the evidence on the voting ID, at least that it does, that that means that the intent has to be there. Well, not necessarily. If you make a law and a certain group of people happens to violate that law more often, then that's not you out to get the person necessarily. If, for example, if you made a law about speed limits and speed minimums, well, older people tend to drive slow, so are you discriminating against old people? Why do you hate old people? No, that's not the intent of the law. We're trying to keep everybody safe, and so whether it's a young person driving too slow or an old person driving too slow, we'll enforce the law. Now, we may have to enforce it a little bit disproportionately because older people tend to drive too slow. Or, you know, by contrast, we tend to arrest more young people when we have a speed maximum, a speed limit, because they tend to drive faster. Well, you're not going after one particular group just because it happens to disproportionately affect that group. And so that's just, I use that as an example just to explain to you that what Jane Crenshaw talking about is talking about is that Hank Johnson is assuming intent. He's assuming some kind of malicious intention behind the Trump voter, and that's really the problem that you're running into. And what's so ironic about this whole thing is this attitude that Hank Johnson has is exactly what got Trump elected in the first place. It was people that got tired of being told that they're racist and bigoted and backwards and homophobic and somebody that just needs to shut up and get in the back of the bus. That's what they were being told over and over and over again. I mean, you had dads there that were told that they were evil, horrible monsters for not wanting a 35-year-old man to go in the bathroom stall next to his six-year-old daughter. These are the things that really got people upset. These are the reasons that people, especially on the social cultural level, really liked Donald Trump because he was the guy that said, no, that's stupid, shut up. Now, is that the best approach to take to a lot of these discussions? I don't necessarily think, think so, but you can understand why that desperation started happening. I'm not justifying the desperation. I'm not justifying the actions that followed that desperation. I'm just observing why it took place. And that's exactly the problem that you continuously ran into. That there were being people, good people, just trying to put food on their table and care for their family that were being called monsters and racist just for supporting, just for disagreeing with someone politically. And so this is the reason that you got Trump in the first place. So ironically, Hank Johnson really by doing this kind of wound up helping Trump and stirring up his base. This is not some, now I don't think it's going to follow over into the election because that's two years off, which is an eternity in political time. I'm just saying that this kind of stuff, this kind of things that the Democrats constantly do, where they try to paint one side of the country as deplorables or people that are beyond the pale, you'll never be able to reach them. They can't understand. They're just idiots. That's the reason that you got Trump in the first place. Hillary Clinton was a glaring example of this. 
trying to paint all married women as people that just listen to their husbands and do whatever they want them to, or trying to paint stay at home moms as lazy and people that just depend on their, their man. I mean, just horrible things that she said about the heartland mid America saying that, well, all the dynamic people on the coast voted for me. It was just those idiots, those country fried rubes out there in the middle of the country, the little faceless masses. They're the ones that were too stupid to vote for me. That attitude comes across, and Democrats have a real problem with their messaging when it comes to that, especially when you've got guys like this, Hank Johnson, coming up and trying to paint a picture with a broad brush of everybody that voted for Trump being a bunch of old, uh, economically depressed alcoholics. That's not helpful to your message. We've got to get away, and I say this on both sides, because Republicans are sometimes guilty of assuming intent as well. On both sides, we have to get away from this idea that half of the country is evil. I don't believe that. I think there's good people and bad people on both sides. And I think you have to take things on an issue-by-issue basis and a case-by-case basis. And so we have to start having these conversations with individuals instead of talking about groups all the time. I realize that sometimes generalization has its place, and sometimes we have to do so in order to make things a little bit easier. But I think that if we put more emphasis on the individual, on individual liberty and what the individual thinks and feels, instead of doing it just on the the mass, the the big group, and try to section ourselves off based on tribe, I think we're going to get a lot further with people if we focus on the individual and instead of assuming the worst, actually get a chance to know them and get an idea of what their intentions really are. Uh, There's a great quote from a guy named, actually his name is Guy, Guy Dowd, and he's somebody that I think back in 1995 won Teacher of the Year. He's now a motivational speaker, uh, English teacher at a high school, and I mean, the guy's just brilliant. He's a great speaker and a really, really talented teacher, and some of the stories he tells are just amazing. And so he's somebody that's been a little bit of a personal hero of mine, and I remember one thing that he said that really stuck with me. That life is a comedy to those who think and a tragedy to those who feel, which I think maybe the reason that I like it so much is I get easily amused at things. And because of that, I I kind of see that as a backhanded compliment that I laugh so much means I must think a lot. And I hope that I do. I I try to do that. Sometimes I fall guilty of, of getting lazy and not thinking. And I think that everybody falls into that trap, at least from, from time to time. But there's certain news stories that you look at and you just kind of have to laugh it off. And so the latest argument on the border that I've seen circulating around is that there are going to be 11, uh, sorry, 111 endangered species that are going to be harmed by the border fence. Now, before I get into the specifics here, I do want to be clear. I'm not saying that there's going to be no environmental impact whatsoever. Anytime you start any construction project, whatever it may be, there is going to be an environmental impact. I mean, if I put up a street sign today, there is an impact on the, the area surrounding that street sign. If I, you know, plant a tree, that has economic, Im- or sorry, environmental impact. If I tear down a tree to build a house, that has environmental impact. And so what we have is, The fact that it's going to affect endangered species and affect the environment around it is not in and of itself inherently bad, or at least it's something that we recognize is worth doing if the the reason for doing so is justified. For example, we need a house, we need a place to live. By putting a house there, we are encroaching upon the environment around us. And that's okay, because we have to do it, we have to have a place to live, and we accept there is going to be some loss to the environment by us doing that. The question is value. How much value do we place on it? Is it something that we value more or less than the outcome? Is it going to be a net positive or a net negative? And so I'm not saying when I laugh at this report that it means that there's going to be absolutely no environmental impact whatsoever and there's going to be no species that are affected by the border wall. All I am saying is that we have to be honest about it and do sort of a cost evaluation here. 
because I think the wall is absolutely worth it. I think that it is something that will be beneficial to us and Mexico. But I'm just saying that they're overplaying their hand by a very wide margin in this. So I've seen several reports come out about this. The one that I'm looking at is from the independent in the UK, but there's several American news companies that jumped on this. I saw an article about it in CNN. Uh, I saw one on ABC news. And so any kind of infrastructure project does have this sort of environmental impact, but I think they're overplaying it by saying that there's 1100 endangered species that are going to be affected by this because we have to keep in mind that the border is largely desert wasteland. Not saying that all of it is, but especially if you're looking at the part of the border wall that has not yet been built, because we, there's a lot of border that it actually has been built. But if you're looking at the part that has not been built, a lot of it is in the Rio Grande Valley in Texas. And so while there's going to be some environmental impact there, sure, it's not going to be nearly as detrimental as a lot of people are assuming that it is. For one thing, a lot of the barriers that have been proposed, that sort of steel fencing kind of thing that you saw when we were doing the coverage down there of the migrant caravan, that's going to be pretty standard issue for a lot of the areas down there. Not all, but some of the areas are going to have that, which means a lot of the smaller animals will be able to get through just fine, and it won't really impact their habitat or environment in a, a very significant way. And so because of this, what you've got going on here is a gross overstatement of the importance. And in this report, it says that ocelots, bears, bighorn sheep, and the U.S.'s last remaining wild jaguars and the bald eagle. So there's a couple of things to unpack here. First of all, I could see it kind of having an impact on ocelots, but bears? Where are there bears on the border? Now, maybe, maybe I'm wrong here. Maybe I'm just not seeing it. But I don't think there's a whole lot of areas that we're proposing border fences where there would be bears. Now, there's some mountains that maybe some bears could live in, but a lot of those mountains we've largely neglected to put border fences up in the first place because it's too expensive, impractical, and people don't really want to cross a mountain anyway. I mean, a lot of those mountains are really treacherous and you wouldn't be able to scale it. It would actually be less trouble to climb a fence than it would be to climb a mountain as you can imagine. And so I have a hard time buying that it's going to be impacting the bears. And here's another thing. If you're talking about just a bear infested mountain, there's going to be bears all over that mountain. I got to believe that you're not going to get a lot of illegal immigrants crossing that anyway. <laughs> I mean, if you've just got a mountain filled with bears and the illegal immigrants looking up at the bear mountain and then looking at the fence, I think he's going to opt to try to scale that fence. A fence is going to be a problem, sure, but it's not going to be a bear-infested mountain. <laughs> so the idea that it's going to impact a bunch of bears, I don't know that that's necessarily true. I didn't even know America had jaguars. I didn't even know that their habitat was down there. Uh, bighorn sheep, again, same thing with the mountain. We're not talking about building a lot of these fences along the mountains, and those would that would be the only environment that the bighorn sheep would be in. And so I'm, I'm trying to figure out exactly how it would impact them in such a way. I don't know about the ocelots. I don't know a whole lot about their environment or where they hang out. But uh, the best one to me at the end is that it claimed it's going to impact bald eagles. Now, I'm not a biologist or an engineer, but wouldn't the eagle be able to fly, you know, over the fence? <laughs> wouldn't he be able to just kind of go over that i don't think that that would affect his habitat or his hunting ground a whole lot considering he can he can go straight over it i don't know maybe you have some really sporting sporting eagles that are just sportsmen and they don't like the advantage that flight gives them so they're hunting like just walking around out there looking for mice but i gotta believe that the fence is not going to have much of an impact on bald eagles <laughs> Again, life is a, a, a comedy to those who think and a tragedy to those who feel. And the fact that I'm looking at this story and seeing a comedy and they're seeing a tragedy, I think is pretty indicative of where our mindset is. The left is looking at this and all they have are the feels. It's all the feels coming at them all at once about these poor animals 
that the bald eagle is going to be looking at this fence from like, I don't know, a thousand feet in the air and going like, yep, that's a fence. And then moving on. Uh, but the fact that, that I see it as a comedy and they see it as a tragedy, I think that that really does show a difference in the way that the people on the left and people on the right tend to think. I tell you what, we're just going to go ahead because of that. And we will go straight to the chaplain's report. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's report this morning comes from the book of Daniel yet again. Like I said, we're going through this little series when it comes to the book of Daniel. And if you'll remember what we were talking about yesterday is the king has had this dream and he wants the people that are surrounding him, the magicians, the Chaldeans, the people that are supposed to be mystics and and experts in this stuff. He wants them to tell him the interpretation of his dream and they can't. And not only does he want them to tell them the interpretation, he wants him to he wants them to tell him the dream because otherwise they could just be making up anything as the interpretation. He's like, no, 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 you have to tell me the dream and then you have to tell me the interpretation and then I'll know that the interpretation is actually real, which actually is weirdly enough a pretty good standard because if they can tell you the dream, they can probably tell you how to translate it, how to interpret it. And so because of this, The king actually has a pretty interesting standard, and you'll remember the other day, these Chaldeans and magicians were saying, nobody can do this. No human being would be able to accomplish this task for you. And they're actually 100% right in this. They, without realizing it, kind of explained why it would have to be God that would be able to do this. It would have to be someone with divine, supernatural power. And so because of this, the king is very upset. He's angry that none of the magicians can do this. But he says, if anybody lies to me, they don't actually know what the dream is, but they try to guess it and they get it wrong. I'm going to kill them. Well, this goes on for a little while. And the king is so upset that he says, you know what? I'm just killing all of my magicians, all of my wise men. You're all going to die. And news of this gets back to Daniel and his young friends and all the other young men from other countries that are being kept there and being sort of made ready to be in the service of the king, the other educated wise men. And Daniel happens to be in that group as well. And we have here this sort of uh, situation where he says, you know what, as king, you guys are worthless. You're all fakes and phonies. And so I'm just going to get rid of all of you. I'm going to kill all of the wise men, all of the wise men in my employ." Even the ones that aren't you, even the ones I haven't even talked to yet, because again, he's a pagan king. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, but this is what he does. And so he just decides he's going to off all of his wise men, all of his magicians and advisors on supernatural matters. And then when this word gets back to Daniel, Daniel says, I'll interpret his dream. I'll do it. And so finally, we have somebody that's volunteering to actually go and interpret the king's dream for him. So props to Daniel, man, he stepped up and think about the kind of faith that it takes for Daniel to do this. He has enough faith in God and the spiritual gift of dream interpretation that he's been given that Daniel's sitting there going, yeah, I can do this. And if I'm wrong, I'll lose my life, but I'm not going to lose my life because God's not going to let me down. Daniel had an amazing amount of faith here. And you have to appreciate that. And here's the irony in this whole thing, because we all know the outcome of the story. But Daniel, through God's power, is about to save from death a bunch of pagan magicians. I want you to think about that. These are a bunch of pagan magicians that worship all kinds of other gods and are engaged in witchcraft and all kinds of other things that God would not approve of. And yet... This is the group of people that are under fire, that are under threat, and they're about to have their lives spared because God performs a miracle through Daniel. So even the fake people, the ones that don't really have supernatural powers, 
are about to be saved by the one true God. There's a healthy dose of dramatic irony sort of floating around in that. And we see how the story unfolds in the second chapter of Daniel, verses 17 through 18, where it says, Then Daniel went to his house and informed his friends Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah about the matter, so that they might request compassion from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his friends would not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So this is essentially Daniel's prescription. He's already agreed to go forward. He's already agreed to interpret the king's dream. And he is the one that is going to be the guy on the hot seat. And I love how he reacts to it. He goes to his house. He gathers up his friends, his brothers, those that love God and worship him just like he does. And they get together and pray about it. That says a lot about Daniel's priorities and a lot about who he trusts. That when this horrible thing is about to happen, when his life is under threat, he says, you know what? We're going to meet up with the brothers, the other people that have the same faith as me, and we're going to pray about it. And that's what's going to solve this problem. This is an amazing testament to how much Daniel believes in God and how much he trusts him to protect him. And so because of this, his three friends there, which, by the way, their other names are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these are the same guys that get thrown into the furnace a little bit later, and we're going to get to that story in a moment. But you're looking at this, and he gets together with these three friends that also have really strong faith and sort of surround Daniel and pray for him and encourage him because they believe in Daniel too. And because God believes in Daniel and he knows that they believe in him as well, Daniel is able to do this very brave thing, going before the king and interpreting the dream for him. And this really mirrors other things, other times, that were complicated in the lives of God's people, where they got together with people they trusted, people that had the same faith as them, and worshipped God and prayed and fasted and, and engaged in other activities like that to call upon God's favor. This happens, for example, in the book of Esther. Esther's entire race is facing extinction from Babylon. And what does she do? She gets together with a bunch of her maids and the people that are ladies in waiting with her, and they fast and they pray. And Mordecai and the Jews that are living in in that particular region at the time, they do the same thing. When you're looking at, for example, Paul, We see several examples in the epistles where groups of people would get together with Paul and pray for him and encourage him when he would leave on a missionary journey. We've got a couple of examples of that in his epistles, records of that actually happening. And another big one that I think about is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus knows that he is about to go this unbelievable trial that no other man has ever faced in the history of this world. And what's his first response? I'm going to get together with a bunch of my brothers and pray about it. I'm going to get together with the apostles, the people that I trust the most, my best friends who love God and and care about him, and we're going to pray about this. So in a sense, Jesus did exactly what Daniel is doing here years before Jesus actually came to earth, is that when he's about to have to face this big trial, when he's about to go through something that's going to be very difficult for him, and when he needs courage and he needs strength, He gets together with his friends who share his faith and go before the Almighty and ask for his favor. This is a great testament of faith for them. And I want to ask how many of our problems would be solved if we just took this same approach? How many problems in our life would we have made easier, not only easier on us, but also God through his providence making them easier on us or helping us with situations like this? Because you'll notice, Daniel isn't asking to forego the trial like Jesus did in the garden, and that's also an acceptable form of prayer. But Daniel's asking for strength to be able to endure this and to be able to perform correctly and to be able to show other people God's power. And so because of this, and because he does get together with his brethren to do so, I think this is a really wonderful example of how we, as individuals, need to get together with our brothers and sisters and pray for strength when we know that there's something that we're going to have to go through. 
Why is prayer so often talked about as a last resort? I think that sometimes even we as Christians forget the power of prayer and the way that it's presented in the Scripture. Because when we have somebody fall sick or somebody that's in trouble, we say, well, he's in the Lord's hands. All we can do is pray about it. And I know we don't mean any harm by that, but there's almost a sense of defeated a defeated mentality in our voice. You know, almost like, well, we tried everything else, so prayer is going to be what we do now. Why don't we pray before the problem comes? And I know you can't always predict that, but why don't we pray before the problem comes, go to God first, make him our first resort instead of our last resort, and then maybe we'll be a lot better off spiritually and physically in the trials of this life. See, Daniel is not only blessed by this, but he's probably encouraged by knowing that his brothers have his back as well. And our first instinct when we're going through something difficult like this should be to lean on God, and part of that is leaning on our brothers that shared the same faith. So many of our problems that we go through, so many of the heartaches that we have, would be made easier on us if we just did that first, if we just went to God and our brothers in Christ first. Stay the course, friends.